Hello, my name is Juan Gonzalez, a rising senior at Virginia Tech, studying environmental horticulture and crop sciences. This summer, I interned at Covercrest in St. Louis, working on a project to evaluate promoter expression for HPPD carryover resistance using gust histochemical assay. HPPD inhibitors are a class of herbicides that prevent weed growth during the corn growing season. Now, although it provides great residual control, it can cause carryover injury to the next soybean growing season, as shown in the image on the right which can reduce its yield potential. This can be very harmful to pennycress as it is planted between corn and soybean. Now it's already been seen in pennycress that overexpressing HPPD confers herbicide resistance. But in order to provide a non-GMO method of HPPD carryover resistance, pennycress must undergo gene editing to replace the HPPD promoter with a strong pennycress promoter. However, selecting the appropriate pennycress promoter remains unclear. A previous iPrefer intern created 11 promoter gust constructs shown below that we will use to compare promoter strength using a technique called gust testochemical assay. By comparing these promoters, we can select the strongest one to switch with the HPPD promoter. Based on the workflow, the goal is to grow two weak seedlings, perform the gust testochemical assay, examine their gust expression, and then rank promoter strength. The gust histochemical assay is a staining technique to visualize tissue-specific expression patterns using a gust gene reporter system. Following the reaction on the right, the products from Exclug undergo an oxidation reaction to form insoluble blue dye. Here is a seedling showcasing the blue color from the gust gene reporter system. Now, Since gust is under the control of a promoter, we can determine the strength of the promoter by visualizing the strength and specificity of the blue stain created from this reaction. However, the gust assay has never been done on pennycress before, and optimization was needed. There are lots of possible parameters involved in the staining process that could be optimized, but after experimenting with the infiltration method, embedding with spermidine, exclude stock solvent, incubation temperature, and incubation length, we finally were able to visualize our first sign of staining in seedlings with a pretreatment method. We found that pretreating with an oxidative catalyst of ferrocyanide and ferrocyanide with a vacuum chamber before adding the exclug, provided a positive staining result within two to three days. So we continue with observing stains across various promoter gust constructs, and with this set, preliminary data shows that five out of the seven promoters produced gust stainings, and gust expression was constitutive in many of these promoters. Now there are currently a few promoters pending for gust comparison, but as of now we do see repeated successful staining in TAAP2M promoter gust construct. We also found that there's a range of the number of successful staining under each promoter, showcasing that there's variability in the gust histochemical staining. To quantify this variability, we've measured the DS red fluorescence and performed a mug assay to measure the gust activity within lines of the same promoter. With line 8.3, there are drastic differences in the gust activity and fluorescence, but even with high levels, there was a lack of staining. With 4.2, fluorescence seems to be similar, but only one was able to be stained. We did not find a correlation between gust activity and histochemical gust staining, suggesting that further optimization is needed for the gust assay to reduce assay variability. Because there is optimization needed for the gust assay, I wanted to give an example of optimization using a workflow diagram for future experimentation. With eliminating all variables other than the independent and dependent variable, and developing a method of recording data, we can come to a conclusion so we can further optimize gust histostaining one step at a time. So in this example, we want to determine the optimal temperature and time for the gust assay. Here, we're going to use several two-week replicated lines and cut the seedlings in half to ensure that the variable is accurately compared. Each half will go into its own tray in two separate temperatures, and in this case, it's room temperature and 37 degrees Celsius. And afterwards, we're going to collect the data over time, and for this instance, photograph these trays at certain time intervals. Once the data is collected, we can compare the replicated lines to fully determine the optimal temperature and time for the gust assay. This method can be applied to several other parameters involved in the gust assay so that the protocol can be fully optimized. So we found that there's assay variation in gust staining and further improvements will need to occur to reduce that assay variation. And we did see repeated successful staining in one of the promoter gust constructs, which can be used as a positive control for the future. The next step is to compare more promoter constructs using an optimized gust assay to select the strongest expression. Doing so can provide HPPD carryover resistance for large-scale commercialization of pennycress. 
And I really want to thank the team at Covercrest for allowing me to experience the world of research and honestly having the patience as I battled through several learning moments in the lab. This truly was a beneficial experience for my future endeavor in research.